My father once told me, privilege is the power to open doors in my life. However, that all changed the day I met a man who had great power, but denied all privilege. He didn't ride in with fanfare and processional. He didn't ride in at all. He walked like everyone else. But he wasn't like everyone else. He touched the people that no one else would even look at. He ate meals with people that others felt only disdain for. Over time, I came to know him. Yeah, I followed him at a distance. I didn't speak up when they talked nonsense about him. I thought I loved him. But I wouldn't even step out of the shadows to follow him. My fear kept me paralyzed. Can I stay in the shadows any longer? Afraid of what people will think of me? He's dead on that cross at Golgotha. His body just hanging there, waiting for a soldier to take him down and throw him in a pit to be buried with criminals. But I will not let that happen. Pilate could kill me just for asking for the body. It may cost me everything. If I get Pilate's permission, then I will go get his body and place it in my tomb. I must, I must do this one thing for him. At least this one thing. This is my tomb, where I was supposed to be buried. And today, it will be used. Jesus will fill up the grave meant for me. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the spotless Lamb, died on the cross for you and I. He took our place. Last week we watched as Barabbas, a murderer, insurrectionist, was freed. While Jesus Christ stepped in, He took our place and He died. He did that because He loves you and He loves me. He took upon Himself the sin of you, the sin of I, the sin of the whole world. He paid the sin debt. And He died. Once He died, once He gave up the ghost, many awesome wonders followed the Savior's death. Jesus, when He had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. We see the temple veil torn completely in half. This will be very significant for Joseph of Arimathea, as we'll see a little later. The earth quaked, there was the rocks rent, the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after His resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many, unto many graves opened when the Savior died. A centurion who was watching all this looked upon Jesus and said, Surely this is the Son of God. So the crucifixion has drawn to an end. The crowd dismisses and leaves the gory scene. 
as everybody departs, goes their way, and goes about their everyday lives. The excitement's over. The crucifixion is done, and our Savior is left hanging on the cross, dead. Discarded. The Jews request that Pilate finish the execution of these criminals. That Pilate takes these criminals, takes the thieves, and takes Jesus off the cross. They ask him because it was just before the Sabbath day was going to begin. The Jews, therefore, because it was a preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Usually, Rome would leave the bodies of their criminals hanging on the cross till they were fully dead. Now, birds of prey would come peck on their flesh. Critters would, would eat their flesh. And they would leave them there until they were completely dead. Then Rome would take the bodies and throw them into a place called Gehenna where they would decompose and burn. But the Jews did not want this to happen because it was a high day. It was a supposed to be a holy day as they were preparing for the Sabbath that next day. So they asked and said, Pilate, can we please remove these bodies from the cross? It was also in the Jewish law that told them they had to take people off the cross. Look here at Deuteronomy 21. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy giveth thee for an inheritance. What hypocrisy by these Jewish people. They had just murdered Jesus Christ. They had just put they had just crucified their savior and they're worried about keeping the law. They are very confused. Their heart is completely wrong. They have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea what's going on. And and don't be fooled, guys. The Jews did not want to take Jesus and 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 give him a nice burial. No, they wanted just to take him off the cross and throw him to the dogs. That's what they wanted. So Pilate sends two men. He says, okay. Verse 32, thank you so much, brother. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So Pilate says, okay, he's going to send some soldiers. The soldiers get there. The two thieves are still alive. So they take rods, listen to this, and they break. They hit the legs of these thieves until the thieves collapse on their cells. Their lungs collapse. They suffocate to death. But they find Jesus already dead, so they didn't have to break his bones. So they take a spear, and they... Pierce it through his flesh, his side, and blood and water comes forth. Well, this just signifies that he actually is dead. The soldiers gaze up at Jesus. They look at him lifeless, bloody, dead, and realize he had already died. The soldiers return to Pilate. They're going to inform him that, okay, Everybody's dead now. We can take them off the cross as Jesus is still left hanging there alone. It was evening. Sunset was nearing. nearing. The Passover was about to be over and the Sabbath was about to begin and all of a sudden a new, appear a new character appears in the Bible. A new character pops on the scene. A man named Joseph of Arimathea. And he asked Pilate for the body of Jesus to bury him. 
And after after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Each, and this is a very significant, guys, every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all mention Joseph of Arimathea. He appears on Scripture, it seems, at the most pivotal point. Jesus, the Messiah, who all Scriptures pointed to, pointed to the Savior. He has died, and now Scripture switches gears all of a sudden, takes the spotlight and puts it right on this man, Joseph, who we've never heard about before, who just pops on the scene. God chose for this man, God chose Joseph to be the main character in the burial of Jesus Christ. Guys, one, Jesus needed to be buried. If Jesus had not been buried and he just lay lifeless on the cross, or if he was thrown into Gehenna, the resurrection, which will happen, which did happen, would be much different. There wouldn't be a whole lot of proof for it, would there? There needed to be a tomb. There needed to be guards, guards there. They needed to be a stone. So there could be an empty grave. Amen? We see the providence of God here as he uses Joseph to accomplish this task. Joseph fulfilled Old Testament prophecy that he'd be buried in a new tomb and he'd be buried with the rich. So here's the question I ask. Why Joseph of Arimathea? Where has he been this far in Scripture? Who even is Joseph of Arimathea? Well, guys, actually, he's been mentioned before. Just not by name. He was mentioned back in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 shows the account uh, or, of the suffering servant, which is Jesus Christ. It prophesies his crucifixion, his death, burial, his resurrection. And in verse 9 of Isaiah 53, we come across this gem of a verse where Joseph is mentioned, just not by name. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the what? Rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Boom! Joseph of Arimathea. Of course, the grave with the wicked, that's him being crucified between two thieves. And the rich, that is Joseph of Arimathea that would bury him. So let us take a look at this individual. Let's take a look at Joseph. Who we will soon see takes it upon himself to bury Jesus. Number one, very obvious by his name, he was from the town of Arimathea. He was a rich man. He was in the top 1%. Money wasn't an issue for him. He was the upper class of society. He was very privileged. Rich. He was a very prominent an honorable man in society. Well respected by the community. He was a just and good man. Truly people respected him and his character. He was a good guy. He was a just guy. Most importantly, listen to this. Surprise, surprise. He was a member of the Sanhedrin Council that voted to put Jesus to death. Wow. He was a member of the council. The very same group that orchestrated the death of Jesus. So we have to ask this question. Why is Joseph a rich man, a man of honor, prestige, a man on the Sanhedrin council seeking Jesus' body. Is it because he's a Pharisee that wants to keep the law of Deuteronomy? That he wants to just get the body off the cross as fast as he can? Is that why Joseph went to Pilate to get the body? 
Had he seen Jesus crucified and die? Did Joseph even know who Jesus was? Did he even care about Jesus and his body? There's one crucial fact I've left out about Joseph. Joseph was a saved man. He was a disciple of Jesus. He was saved. He believed in Jesus. He believed in the promised Messiah. He was a follower of Him. Joseph waited for the kingdom of God. He knew that it was at hand. He knew Jesus would usher in that new kingdom. And he was one of the few rich men in Scripture that actually followed and trusted in the Lord. He didn't allow his wealth. He didn't allow his rich to consume him. What did he do? He loved Jesus. Joseph had not agreed to the death of Jesus. He was a member of the Sanhedrin Council, but he did not agree that Jesus should be put to death. Look here at verse 51. The same had not consented to the council indeed of them. So he was likely there. But when they voted, should we put Jesus Christ to death? He either didn't vote or he voted against it. He didn't consent to Jesus' death. But Joseph kept his stance. He kept his distance as a believer. He did not allow himself to get close to Jesus Christ. He kept it very private. He knew the hostility that the Jewish religious leaders had towards Jesus. He did not want anybody to know that he was a follower of Christ. He was scared. He feared the ruthless Jewish councilmen and religious leaders. He chose to follow Jesus, but he chose to follow Jesus very secretly. So Joseph asked for the body of Jesus. Matthew 27, 57 through 58. When the evening was come, there was a, came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. Everyone has left Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. And we have to ask this question. Why in the world is Joseph the one going to get the body of Jesus? Where's Peter? Where's John? Where are the disciples? Where is his mother? Where's anybody? They're gone. They fleed, they scattered, they left him there. So Joseph is the man who takes responsibility. That's so interesting. <laughs> you know, it's customary at this time for a relative or close friend to come and ask for the body, but they're gone. The disciples had openly followed Jesus all his ministry. And they left, but the man who secretly followed Jesus stepped forward. We see the heart of Joseph here. We see his heart by the actions that he has taken. We see truly who he is. He has witnessed his Lord and Savior brutally beaten and crucified. He is moved with sadness and a heavy heart as he looks on him dead on the cross. He knows that he must take action. He could not let Jesus just hang there any longer, be a public spectacle as people pass by and just saw him in that state. No, Joseph could not take it. He could not stand the fact of imagining Jesus being disposed of and thrown into Gehenna, a place of fire and filth and decay. He did not want that to happen. He couldn't imagine that. This was the Messiah that was hanging there. Watch the Lamb. This was Jesus Christ who had died for you, who had died for me, who had died for Him, hanging there, lifeless. He could not allow Him to continue to be there. Jesus cured the sick. 
He healed the blind. He cast out demons of the possessed. He forgave people of their sins. And in his most time of need, when he was dead, somebody needed to bury the body. And nobody was there but Joseph. Joseph truly loved Jesus and he wanted to make sure he had a proper burial. Joseph had been silent about his love for the Lord up till this point, but he could not keep it quiet any longer. He needed to step out. He could not keep his devotion for the Lord a secret any longer. He was convinced that it was time for God to use him, that God had prepared him for such a time as this. We see a great change in Joseph. If you look in the Gospel of John, it says he followed Jesus secretly for fear of the Jews. Then if you go to Mark, it says he boldly walked up to Pilate and asked for the body. Do you want to change secretly following Jesus? And then he walks boldly to the Roman governor. Something changed in him. i tell you one thing that I guarantee you changed his mindset at this time. What happened when Jesus died? There was two things. What was the first thing we mentioned? The temple veil was torn from top to bottom. This was in the temple. And there was about 14 men on this council. And I tell you, they would be the first people that would have known about the tearing of this veil. As soon as it tore, I, he might have been there in the temple. I don't know where he was. He either saw it happen, or as soon as it happened, they came up to him and said, Hey, Joseph, you're a member of this council. I need to tell you something. The temple veil is rent. And when he had heard that, he knew that that was God. He knew God had torn that veil. He knew that it symbolized people could now walk into the Holy of Holies. People, by the grace of God, can now stand in His presence. Because Jesus died. Joseph of Arimathea understood what the veil being torn meant. The religious leaders had no idea. They never had any idea. Guys, by the way, after this, they put a veil back up and they did it double. They had no idea what the purpose of this was. Joseph did. Surely this was something that also changed Joseph's mind, changed his heart, and pushed him to do something about the body of Jesus. God had prepared Joseph, listen, for such a time as this. Here's the first reason. Joseph was a what man? A rich man. Because of that, he had purchased a tomb for himself. Only rich people had their own personal tomb, and Joseph did. Joseph had used some of his wealth to get a, uh, a, a tomb hewn out of the rock hillside near Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. He would prepared for himself a nice, luxurious, private tomb. When Jesus died... Surely Joseph looked at Jesus and thought, where will he be buried? And then boom, wait a minute. I have a tomb. Not too far from here. Must I give Jesus mine? There wasn't time. There was hours before the Sabbath started. There wasn't time for him to go negotiate to buy a new tomb. Surely he was faced with a decision. Have you ever had that time in your life where you know something needs to be done then it's laid on your heart and you kind of take a, a, a gulp and say, I think I might need to do that. You ever had that time in your life? Joseph had that time. He stood there and thought, okay. He can see his tomb surely from Golgotha. And he says, there's my tomb. It's empty. Nobody's been laid in it before. And he, Jesus needs to be buried. Should I give him my tomb? He contemplated this but realized there was no choice. He must do it. He must give his tomb to Jesus. So God prepared him in that way. Secondly, God prepared Joseph simply by who Joseph was. Listen. 
Joseph was an honorable man. He was a member of the council. I t- not just an everyday average Joe could just walk into Pilate's hall and say, Hey, Pilate, you got a sec? I need something. No, you couldn't do that. You had to be prominent, honorable, probably a member of the council to get, to get his ear because Pilate would work with the Jewish council so he could keep peace with them. So, in reality, there might not have been another man to do this job that needed to be done in all of Israel at this time except who? Joseph. This was his time. God had prepared him for such a time as this. Joseph knew that he was the best person to approach Pilate to ask him this question. So this was it, guys. Joseph knew God wanted him to fulfill this task. He knew it was time to put his life on the line. To step out on faith and follow Jesus boldly and publicly. So he approaches the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Now Pilate had just issued the death of Jesus hours earlier. And I'll tell you this, Pilate was tired of the Jews at this time. Okay? They they woke him up early that morning. (laughs) They got him out of bed. And they said, hey, can you do us a favor and crucify this man? And you know what he said? No, I don't want to. He does nothing wrong. And they insist. And he says, okay, finally, I'll do it. So then he puts him up there with Barabbas. And then he says, okay, Jews, he's done nothing wrong. Let me beat him. Let me scourge him. Then I'll release it. And they said, no, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Release Barabbas. Release Barabbas. He tried several times. They They wouldn't listen to him. So he says, okay, that's fine. This has been hours that morning. He says, fine, take Barabbas. We'll crucify Jesus. So he wipes his hands. The crowd accused him of not being a friend to Caesar. And Pilate's wife has come to him earlier and said, I had a dream about Jesus. And guess what? You don't need to do this. He was tired of this whole situation. Not to mention a few minutes earlier, Jews came to him and said, okay, one last thing, let me bother you once more. Can we get these guys off the cross? We won't observe the Sabbath. He's thinking, fine. And now Joseph (laughs) comes to him. Guys, this wasn't, they weren't buddies. This was Roman Jews. They were not buddy-buddy. Joseph could be killed. It's a snap of a finger. Pilate surely was at the end of his rope with these people. Nevertheless, he knows he must go. So he says, Pilate, can I have the body of Jesus? You know what Pilate said? Pilate marveled if he were already dead. Calling unto him the centurion, he asked whether he had been a while dead. And when he knew of it, centurion, and when he knew of it, the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. So what had happened? He says, "Is he even dead yet? Uh, probably not." So he, he sends to the people and says, "Okay, y'all checked it out. Is he dead?" And they said, "Yep." So Pilate gave the body to Joseph. Now let's stop. He what? The body to Joseph he gave. It was customary at this time. This is another way God prepared Joseph for this moment right here. It was customary at this time to bribe Rome. If you wanted something done, you bribed him. You gave him money. Joseph would have known this. Joseph surely had his checkbook ready. What do you need? I'll write it for whatever you want. Just give me Jesus. And Pilate gave it. Why do you think he did that? Just take him. I'm done. Take this body. Take your Jesus and get out of here. I've had enough of this today. So Pilate gave the body to Joseph. Joseph heads to the cross. 
He walks up the hill of Golgotha. The stench of death flies as bones crushed under his feet of recently crucified people as he looks up and sees Jesus Christ on the cross. He very carefully and gently takes down Jesus' body. He was surely helped by others. He couldn't have done this himself. He, he was a rich man. He had servants. He was surely helped by others. But he was the main character. As he took Jesus down, guys, he held Jesus Christ. Brutal, unrecognizable. Beaten, bruised, dead, cold body. In his arms. A man that he had followed at a distance for so long. And now he was closer to Jesus than he had ever been. And Jesus was dead. What remorse he must have felt. He waited till this moment to step out. He waited until Jesus had died to finally follow him publicly. How his heart must have been filled with regret as he wants to finally talk to Jesus face to face. But he's dead. So what happens next? They prepare the body for burial. There came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Nicodemus. Y'all remember him? He was also a very prominent man, a ruler of the Jews, a very high Pharisee. Can you believe at this time in Jesus' life, all his followers are gone, all his disciples, and now you've got two people who have secretly followed Jesus all of their life. Now they step forward and they prepare Jesus' body for burial. They couldn't, they didn't, Jesus was not going to be thrown to the dogs. Jesus was going to get a proper burial. And what better than two of the most wealthy people around? So they get very fine linen cloth. They're filthy, guys. Don't think this is a clean process. But they clean his body. Nicodemus had brought a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe. They wrapped them and the fine linen cloth around Jesus' body and these were surely the best money could buy. With every wrap, with every second that passed as they prepared His body for burial, surely they were filled with great sadness as remorse as Jesus had helped and cured so many people and now it was them that was burying him. Jesus is then taken. His body laid in Joseph's tomb. You know, the last time Joseph was in this tomb, when do you think that was? Yeah. Probably when he was touring it. <laughs> He probably thought, this is a good one. <laughs> I want to have this. And he did not expect to be there unless he was dead. And he was being laid in there. But now he finds himself right there with the Messiah, his Savior, Jesus Christ, laying in the spot that he was supposed to lay. He's now laying somebody else's body there. 
He has completely given his property, his tomb to Jesus. As he steps out, and they roll the stone in front of the door. Stone would have been uphill. Several people would have, it's a big stone. They would have rolled it downhill slowly, nudged it there on the door so it could not be easily moved. You think you had a long day this week. Joseph of Arimathea had a day. He had just been a part of a council that had voted to crucify Jesus Christ. He didn't consent. He sees Barabbas take Jesus' place. Jesus is beaten. He's crucified. He sees Jesus die. Then he makes the bold decision to go to Pilate. Then he goes and he takes Jesus' body off the cross. He wraps Jesus' body, prepares him for burial. Then he lays him in his tomb. Can you imagine as he turns to go home, him thinking about all the events that had happened that day in his life? Joseph had an encounter with Jesus. He had had an encounter once before in his life. He had trusted Jesus as his Savior. That's the first encounter you must have. I ask you that this morning before we go further. You must first trust Jesus as your personal Savior. That's the first encounter you must have. Have you done that? Then, Joseph has another encounter. But it was unlike any others. His encounter was with the dead body of Jesus Christ. He... And whoever helped him would have been the only people to handle ever the dead body of Jesus Christ. This was not the encounter he would have liked to have. Nevertheless, it was the encounter he needed to have. It was the encounter God had prepared him for. Joseph had lived a life of luxury had lived a life of ease, had lived a life of pleasure, had lived a life of popularity, and he secretly followed a man who lived a life quite the opposite. Jesus did not live luxurious. He didn't live with privilege. He didn't live with ease. Jesus didn't even have a place to lay his head. They lived quite opposite lives. Joseph was served much of his life. Jesus served. As Joseph looked, as Joseph had trusted in Jesus as a Messiah, but he never allowed Jesus to truly change his life and his actions. As he looked at Jesus hanging there from the tree, he knew what he needed to do. He must not continue to try to hold on to his worldly status and his possessions. No, he must give up whatever he must to serve his Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Jesus gave up his personal tomb for Jesus would finally have a place to lay his head. What an encounter. So we ask the most important question this morning. Brother Miller, how is this encounter significant to me? It happened, that's great, but how does it affect me? How does it affect you? First, do not spend your life following Jesus at a distance. Amen? Do not spend your entire life being a secret disciple of Jesus Christ. 
it does not matter who you are around, who you are with, where you are at in your life. Don't just follow Jesus in church or around your church friends, but be public and outspoken about your faith. Next, will you let your faith work? Joseph had lived a life, he was saved, but he never allowed his faith to work. He did not allow his faith to produce works in his life. Then at the moment, he knew that he needed to start serving Jesus with everything God had given to him. So I ask, will you allow your faith to produce works in your Christian life? Dedicate your life to service and dedication to the Lord. God has given you everything you need. God has prepared you for such a time as this. God wants to use you. Will you allow Him today, next? Will we give ourselves to Jesus? We sang a song this morning, Devotion. What was it? Somebody tell me. Somebody say it out loud. Say it out loud. I surrender all we sang this morning. That's right. Will we surrender all? Completely surrender to the master Joseph did. Joseph stepped forward, not only in giving his time, but Joseph gave his tomb he had purchased. It was a significant offering. Joseph felt there was no other option, though. He had to serve his master. Joseph loved Jesus, and out of that love, tenderly took Jesus off the cross, buried him in his own tomb. Christian, next. Christian. Sin no longer, can I get an amen? Sin no longer has dominion over you. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He took your sin and it was buried never to rise again. Amen? Jesus rose from the tomb. But I tell you what, your sin didn't. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. Your sin stayed buried as He raised with victory and newness of life. And when you are saved, He gives you victory over your sin. If you've been saved, your sin's buried. Your old nature is crucified. It's never going to be alive again. It has been rendered inoperative. It has no, listen, Christian, sin has no power over you. Not one bit. It stayed there. It's defeated. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is what? Freed. Amen. Amen. Freed from sin. If you have lived a life of, de of being defeated by sin, allow Jesus Christ to fight that battle for you because He's already won it. Your sin's dead and buried. Don't allow it to conquer your life. Do not allow it to control you. I've given this illustration before. When somebody, when somebody dies and they're laid in the casket and they're put up here, okay, when if all their sin comes by, oh, they had trouble with alcohol, and alcohol comes and tries to tempt them and tries to shake them and says, drink, you think they're going to drink? They're dead. Or when this temptation comes, come on, it's time to do it, come on. It, they're dead. That temptation has no power over that. And if you are saved, it has no power over you. Yield to Christ. Further read that chapter. It's dead and buried. And Jesus died so we might live. Galatians 2.20 I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus was laid in the tomb that was meant 
for Joseph. Je Jesus took our place on the cross and He took our place in the grave. And there is no greater love. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. He took your place on the cross. And he was buried. He took it upon himself. All your sin. All your sin. All your shame. And he died with it. He paid the price for your sin. In order that you would not have to be condemned for it. You see. We are all sinners. And we all come short of God's glory. And because of that, we fall short of heaven. As we all stand, our musicians come forward. We all fall short of Jesus Christ. We are all sinners. And because of that, we fall short of heaven. We are unable to be good enough to be forgiven of our sins. And go to heaven on our own. But God provided a way. God provided a way for us to go to heaven. That was through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in a tomb. And He was resurrected. He is the only way you can go to heaven. He is the only way you can be saved. First, I ask, do you believe this today? And if you have never trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, will you repent of your sin and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? He is offering you salvation today. If the Holy Spirit is convicting, if He is moving in your life, in your heart, will you respond? The only way for you to be saved and have victory over sin, the only way for you to be forgiven is if you will believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you will put your faith and trust in Him. Today, this invitation is for you. Will you have an encounter with Jesus as we sing?